There's two chairs over here as well. So for those of you who are watching, are we alive on YouTube? For those of you who are watching on YouTube, we're having a Bible study here at our office. And, um, and, we, and we've got a decent-sized studio, but we had, um, I had an event yesterday, and I invited some folks to come, and they did. And then the folks who come regularly invited some folks, and so we got a lot of folks here, which is good. So give yourselves a hand for being here. Make some noise, make some noise, make some noise. So I, I, don't, I don't know how many people we have in here, but a good amount, and I'm glad you are here. Um, so last week we talked about productivity hacks for 2023. And, from Gen and then their productivity hacks from Genesis 1. We're going to pick up where we left off. And, like, I was just thinking about what I'm going to share today and got chills. Like, the hair stood up on my arm. Now it's doing it again. Just thinking about what I'm going to share today because it'll help, you be it'll help you become so productive. And not just productive and unfulfilled, but productive and fulfilled, right? Um, it's, it's really interesting how, as human beings, we it's just part of the nature of being a human being, we like to feel like we're right, right? And so what we'll do is we'll look at people who are different than us and look at the good aspects of our lives and think, well, if they were more like us, they'd have what we have, right? Or we look at people who are, um, who are uh, more fulfilled than us, and then we think, yeah, they have that, but they don't have what we have, right? And so, but, but if you understand that life is not a competition, Right, and, and in fact, if you really understand that life is not a competition, you understand it at the highest level, you will understand not only is life not a competition, but in life you have no competition. Because God uniquely created you to do the thing that you are the only person in human history who can do that thing. Now that's pretty stinking amazing cool, right? So uh, we were looking at Genesis chapter one last week. We ended up just talking about the fact that it says in Genesis chapter one, verse five, it says in the evening and the morning were the first day, right? We talked about the fact that it said the evening and the morning were the first day, not the morning and the evening, and that's important. So there are no wasted words. There are no wasted syllables. There are no wasted punctuations in scripture. Everything matters, right? And there are not really punctuations, like a jot and a tittle are really, are really like nakud. They're the marks that you put on he the Hebrew aleph bait so, because there are no vowels, so you know what sound, vowel sound to make, right? But anyway, there are no wasted jots or tittles. There are no wasted accents. So everything matters. And if you understand that everything matters and you allow your curiosity to wake up, what will happen is you'll read something like the evening and the morning were the first day, and then your brain will say, well, why does that matter? Right? In fact, I, 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 you've heard me say this before. Uh, Genesis 1-1 is about God creating the heaven and the earth. And Genesis, I mean, Genesis 1 is about God creating the heavens and the earth. And Genesis 1-1 says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Well, my question, like, as I study the Bible for a long time has been, well, that's pretty amazing. So why is he going into all this detail? Because Genesis chapter 1 could have been chap chapter 1, verse 1, and he could have just gone on to chapter 2. But he started going into all this detail, and he started going into all this detail because God, we, sh we saw last week that God is creative and therefore it's his nature to create. That's why he created the heaven and the earth, because it's his nature to create. And then we saw that, and then we saw, okay, the first thing he tells about him is that he's created. The first thing he tells about us is that he created us in his image, and he created us to create. So if you think about the fact that he created us to create, and he made us to make stuff, that's pretty amazing. That's pretty cool, right? And so I see Genesis chapter 2, Genesis chapter 1 from verse 2 and following, as God showing us the process of creation so we can pattern, everybody say pattern. pattern. We can pattern the things we create based on his creative process, right? So if when you read the Bible, if you don't read it from a religious lens, if you read it from a practical lens and you start looking and stop looking for religion and start looking for principles and promises and precepts and practices and patterns and prophecies and prayers and what'll happen is, y'all just come on in. They'll, they'll, somebody on my team will find a chair for you somewhere, somehow, some way. So you, you're fine. Y'all, you can walk across because you're not walking in front of the camera. It's, it's okay. So, um, so when you understand that, you start looking for the patterns. Why? Because if you can look for the pattern and you can find the pattern, that tells you how you can create something new based on an old pattern, like a seamstress. Okay, a seamstress or a tailor. What they will do is they will make a pattern, and then they will cut out the material to match the pattern. Are y'all tracking? So, so 
a blueprint for a house is a pattern. Well, the Bible is filled with patterns that show us how to make and create things. And so we looked last week at, you know, intention, and then we looked at disruption following intention, and then we looked at um, inspiration, and, and then we looked at um, um, illumination, and then segmentation to completion. And we talked about how it said the evening and morning were the first day, which show the, the, um, the Hebrew calendar starts at night. The Hebrew day starts at night, right? This is fascinating side note that somebody might be interested in. Um, like, there's no possible way that Jesus could have been crucified on a Friday, like they talk about Good Friday. Like, that's not, that's impo- there's, there are not three days between Friday and Sunday, right? So it's not possible. So Good Friday is like, it's like, I mean, it's the thing people do, but it's not, it's not biblical, right? Um, because there's no way Christ, if you say, okay, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, well, that, that's three days, but it's not three nights. Friday night, Saturday night, that's only two nights. So if you understand that the day starts at night, you would understand that Christ was probably crucified on a Friday, and di- I mean on a Wednesday, and died Wednesday evening. So Wednesday night, Thursday night, Friday night, because Shabbat ends on Saturday night. So the end, when Shabbat ends on Saturday night, that's the beginning of Sunday. So a lot of people don't, like, it's an aside. You say, why are you talking about that right now? Because the evening and the morning were the first day. And that, that's, a, that's an aside that most people don't think about when they're actually reading and studying the Bible, right? So, but that's not the significance of the evening and the morning being the first day. Uh, we talked about segmentation to completion. God didn't save any of day two's work for, I mean, day one's work for day two. But the thing that I didn't say last week about the evening and the morning being the, second, the first day, and then the evening and the morning being the second day, and the evening and the morning, the thing I didn't say last week, the reason it's important that the evening and the morning are the first day and the evening and the morning are the second day, because in God's economy, things always go from darkness to light, not from light to darkness. Okay. And so that's, that's important for us to understand. That's why it's so important that the day starts at night, not just so I can prepare for tomorrow tonight, but also because in God's economy, things always go from worse to better because that's how God operates, right? God's going to turn your night into day, and Satan wants to turn your day into night. Okay, anyway, so, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pump the brakes a little bit because i got to slow down. Because I got really, really excited when I knew what I was going to share this morning. And I'm thinking about it right now, and the hair stand up on my arms. And, and so, so I was thinking, like, pr- productivity is really important to being successful in life. We have to produce, right? We, we, it, 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 we, have to, we have to become productive. And what's really cool, I taught in my class uh, the last two days, Monday and Tuesday, I taught a concept that I learned last year. It was one of my biggest takeaways from 2022 and that is Price's Law. And so Price's Law states that 50% of the production of any domain is produced by the square root of the domain. Right, so what does that mean? That means, uh, okay, for instance, um, it's it's really fascinating if you start with small numbers, right? Because two times two is four, so the square root of four is two, right? So two times two is four, okay, cool. Which means 50% of the production, if you have four salespeople, 50% 50% of the production of that sales team is going to be done by 50%. Well, that, that seems to make sense. But when you take 3 times 3, now it changes. Because the square, 3 times 3 is 9. So the square root of 9 is 3. So now, if you have 9 salespeople, the production of that sales organization is going to be produced by 3 people. 50% of the, of the production of that sales organization is going to be produced by 30% of the people. Or 33% of the people. Wait a minute. So the bigger the organization gets, the smaller the productive units get. By the way, this is some of the best news in the world for people who want to be successful. I'll tell you why in a minute. So, so if you take 5 times 5, right, or 4 times 4 is 16. So if you have 16, the square root of 16 is 4, which means if you have 16 salespeople, half of the production is going to be, do, pr- be produced by 4 people, right? And then you, the numbers keep getting bigger. If you go to 5, it's 25, and now 5%, 5 people are producing half of the results. Right, so let's get to some really big numbers, 100. The square root of 100 is 10. So if you have 100 salespeople, 50% of the sales are gonna be produced by 10 salespeople. So 90% of the people split the other 50%. And by the way, it's not just true with people and it's not just true with sales, like it's literally a natural law. Like if you have, if you have nine tomato plants, three of the tomato plants will produce half the tomatoes of your garden. It's just, it just exists the way it is. And, and I, love, I love the fact that it's a principle because we can learn something from a principle, 
right? And so, and so here's what's amazing. Let's say you have, let's say you have 100 times 100, that's 10,000. So if you have 10,000 companies, right, 50% of the gross sales of those 10,000 companies, 50% of the profitability will be produced by 100 companies. Isn't that exciting? I'm, I'm, I'm going somewhere. Just, uh, trust me, when, when the plane lands, you're going to be so happy. It's going it's, it's to be like when you land a plane in Chicago and everybody starts clapping because you're like coming in like this, right? Uh, so, 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 so if you have a million businesses in the United States, 50% of the gross domestic product will be produced by 1,000 companies. I want you to wrap your mind around what a small percentage 1,000 is of 1 million. But it's the square root of 1 million. So what do we learn from this that we can apply to our lives? Here's what we learn. Excellence scales incrementally. I'm going to say it again slower. Excellence scales incrementally, but mediocrity scares expo- scales exponentially. Mediocrity, being average, is at large scale. So a lot of people say, well, I'm going to solve income inequality. But the only problem, you can't. Because Price's Law says that most people don't, want, don't care enough to be something. They don't care enough to do something. They don't care enough to do more than average. The percentage of people that care enough to become more than average, do more than average, have more than average, gets smaller and smaller as the numbers of people get larger and larger. So excellence scales incrementally, and mediocrity scales exponentially. Now, which means... We now have a choice. Like, I don't have to be a victim of circumstance because there's almost no competition at the elite level. Because most people just don't care enough to be that elite. You think about how many basketball players there have been in the history of basketball, but how many, like, great, great, great ones have there been? Less than 20, right? And so when you think about this, we can have a decision. We can make a decision today. I am not going to be one of the mediocre many. I'm going to be one of the fantastic few. I can decide that. And and, and people think, oh, but it's so hard. It's so hard. No, no, no. It's hard to stay at the bottom. At the bottom, everybody else on the bottom is jealous of you. At the top, everybody else at the top who's really at the top is celebrating you. Because they know if it's yours... They don't need it, and if it's theirs, you don't want it. Okay, (laughs) okay. So we're talking about being productive, right? And so make up your mind. Like, here's what's going to happen. All of us in this room, all of us watching on YouTube, all of us watching on Zoom, here's what's going to happen. We are either going to be one of the mediocre many, or we're going to be one of the fantastic few. But we decide that. No, 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 society. No, 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 don't, 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 don't you blame that on society. Because in every society, there have been people who have ridden abo- risen above their circumstance. Now, when God created everything in Genesis chapter 1, we have to remember that he created three categories in creation. How many categories? Talk to me, everybody. How many? Three. He created three categories in creation. The first category he created in creation was creation. He created the sun, the moon, the stars, the grass, the water, the trees, um, oxygen, stuff. He created creation. The second category was creatures. Dogs and cats and giraffes and chimpanzees and alligators. And then the last thing he created was creators. Creators, creatives, he created man in his image. Now, here's where it gets, okay, I want you, I want you to see this. And, and the reason I'm talking about, like, I don't want you to get lost in the idea of productivity for productivity's sake, right? I want you to understand that you can find purpose in your productivity, and you can find fulfillment in your productivity. So in Genesis chapter 1, in verse number 26, um, and God said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing. The first thing I want you to see, God started talking different when he created man. Okay, so if you go back to Genesis 1, verse number 3, it says, and God said, let there be light. Let there be light. When God created creation, he said, let there be. And then it says, he called the light day, the darkness he called night. And then God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the water. So he said, let there be a firmament. So when God was creating creation, he just said, let there be. 
Are y'all tracking? But when God started creating, cre and God called the firmament heaven, okay, um, uh, verse number 11, and God said, let the earth bring forth. So when God started creating, when God, I'm kind of getting ahead of what I'm going to teach probably next week, but when God started, when, after God created the earth, he set up this concept called delegation. He said, I'm going to create things that, I'm going to create things that create things. I'm going to make things that make things. So he said to the earth, let the earth he said, let the earth, uh, where was it? Verse 11. And God said, let the earth bring forth grass and herb yielding seed and fruit yielding fruit after its kind. And then we go down to verse number um, 19, I think it is. Verse 19, nope, verse uh, 21. Verse 21, no, verse 20. And God said, let the waters bring forth abundantly moving creatures that hath life and fowl that it may fly above the earth in the open firmament of the heaven. And God created the whales and every living creature that moveth upon the earth and the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind. See how he delegated the production of fowl and fish to the water. He delegated the production of grass and also the land animals to the earth. He said, let there be, and then he said, let the earth bring forth and let the water bring forth. But he didn't say, let there be man. And he didn't say, let the waters bring forth man. And he didn't say, let the earth bring forth man. Are y'all tracking? Okay. Just want to make sure we're on the same page. Then we get down, uh, and he says, verse 24, it says, oh, and it says, by the way, in the evening and the morning were the fifth day, um, 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 verse 23, evening and morning were the fifth day, verse 24, and God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures after his kind, and creeping things, and beasts of the earth after his kind, and it was so. And God made the beast of the earth after his kind, meaning after the kind of the beast of the earth, uh, and the cattle after their kind, and every... Uh, thing that creepeth upon the earth after his kind, and God saw that it was good. Verse 26, and, th and God said, let us make man. God made man. He didn't talk to the earth. He didn't talk to the water. He started talking to himself. <laughs> he said, let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the creatures and the creation. That's, by the way, this is imperative. So this is why the earth is not my mother. The universe is not God. And we are not running out of resources. God gave man dominion. Man is not a higher form of animal. Man, man is a totally different species than an animal. So it says, let's make man our image. Let him have dominion over the, okay, uh, over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over the earth and over everything that creepeth, over all the earth and over everything that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God created him. Male and female created he them. Um, and um, where was I? Created he them, and God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply, replenish the earth, subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And God said, behold, I have given to you every green herb which is upon the earth, and every tree which is in the uh, Who's, which is the fruit of the tree, yielding seed to you it shall be it for meat and every beast um, of the earth and fowl of the air and everything that creepeth upon the earth wherein there is life. I have given every green herb and it was so and God made everything that he had made and behold it was very good and the evening and the morning were the sixth day. This is the last day. So man is the last thing God made on the last day he was making stuff. Here's why that's important. Because we see in the story, now we have to go all the way to chapter three, and I, which I'm not gonna read to you, I'm just gonna show it to you, I'm gonna explain it to you, we'll get there eventually. But you have to understand, God made us to make stuff and he created us to create stuff, but creation by itself does not create fulfillment in us. Why? Because God created us in his image. And if you see what he created, the first thing he created, he created creation and, cre he created creation and creatures. And we could lump them into a basket and just call that his creation. But then he created man in his image. Why did God create man in his image? He had the animals, he had the trees, he had the sun, he had the moon, he had the stars. Why did he create man in his image? Because God didn't just want to have creation, God wanted to have connection. And the link between physicality and spirituality is the Aleph Dalad Mem, the Adam, Aleph being the letter that represents God, Dalad Mem is blood, a God-like creature with flesh and blood who could, ha who could operate in the earthly realm and stay connected to the spiritual realm. That's why God created man. God created man for connection. 
And that is why people don't feel fulfilled unless they are connected. Why? Because we're made in the image of God, and God connects. Therefore, we have a, an innate desire to connect. We have an innate desire to connect with other people. That's why um, during um, the COVID situation, <laughs> people felt so sad, angry, because they forced people to stay separate from one another. Because it's easier to create, indoct it's easier to create indoctrination in isolation than it is in connection. And so it's really fascinating when you wrap your mind around the idea that God made us for connection. You'll see why in a minute. And then man rejected God's love, truth, and abundance in Genesis chapter 3 and listened to his enemy. It's amazing how self-destructive we can be as human beings, isn't it? And man severed the connection that God created us for. And we severed the connection via sin. And guess what happened? God, Adam and Eve, what did they do after they sinned? They made themselves aprons and hid themselves amongst the trees of the garden. They made aprons out of leaves. They sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. What did God do? God clothed them with a coat of what? Skin, which means something had to die and sacrifice its life for their covering. Which is a picture, by the way, which is a picture of the fact, oh, hallelujah, which is a picture of the fact that Christ was going to come and he was going to die on the cross for the sins of man and his blood, the shedding of his blood, would be the covering for man's sin. That's what that's a picture of. So here's where, here's, where fulfill, here's where fulfillment comes from. Like you can be partially fulfilled if all you do is create. But if all you do is create, you're going to be partially fulfilled and partially miserable. This is why some rich people are so miserable. Some rich people are miserable because they're great at creating and terrible at connecting. And you can't be fulfilled if all you do is create. You make stuff and you got this great big kingdom of stuff that you made, but you don't have anybody to share it with. Like we just finished this two-day mastermind. One of the things that's so excited about a whole lot of people who are thinking about the same stuff, who celebrate the same stuff, come together and are like, oh, we're not as crazy as those people who didn't come here thought we were and told us we were all week or for the rest of the year, right? And so we have a connection with people who are like us. The reason a man and a woman get married is because they want that connection. Like, I've always wanted a wife since I ever, well, since not always, but since the first time I ever saw a girl. I said, oh, yeah, I got, I got to have me one of them. I was not, you know, I saw a girl. I said, I got six brothers. I saw a girl. I'm like, well, what do you know? They have girls. Right? <laughs> don't, don't, don't start, don't act like you tripping, because you know. Okay, anyway. <laughs> I'm, I'm not confused. I don't know. Yeah, let me, yeah. They don't look like my brothers. <laughs> Can I get a witness? Anyway, so, <laughs> and I've always wanted a family to take care of. I've always wanted, like my whole, I, I, would, I would see my dad do these amazing things, like, you know, I saw one time my brother's, there was a kite contest down at the park in Lewistown, Pennsylvania, and my brother Jeff's kite got away. My dad started running after it. And this was like way before the $6 million man. And I heard, I'm like, how can somebody run that fast? It was amazing. I've seen, I, I, I saw my dad get up early, go to work, come home exhausted. And I was like, I want to do that for somebody. I want to I want to have that thing where you where you're where you're the provider and the protector and and the promoter in your house. I want that. I want that kind of connection. I want to have a connection with some little kids who call me dad. I want I want that. It's 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 natural. Here's here, okay. You 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 want I wanted that connection, but connection like Having creation and connection makes us feel more fulfilled than just having creation. Yeah. 
Having creation ha- makes us feel way, way more fulfilled than not having creation, right? But then God did this amazing thing by s- sending his son. He had this thing called contribution. The ultimate in fulfillment is when our lives are a beacon of creation, connection, and contribution. Then I'm, I am fulfilled. I am filled to the full. I'm filled to the full because I made something that makes other people's lives better. I'm filled to the full because I'm connected with other people who are not me. And I can, look, I can do something good for somebody who's not me. I can put a smile on somebody's face who's not me. That makes me feel connected. And then I can contribute to somebody who's not me. And it makes me feel so fulfilled. Here's what's really interesting. Creation, God, it's, it's really interesting. You ever think about this? A, an animal never, like a horse never got together with another horse and said, you know what? Why don't we invent a wheel and maybe put a box on it and call it a trailer? Never th- they never thought about it. But see, God installed something in us. He didn't install in animals. You know what he installed in us? Can't, like from the factory. It's this thing called curiosity. And curiosity, like, like creation, satisfies curiosity. That's why we make stuff. We look at something and say, well, that's okay, but what if we added this? Well, what if we added that? But what if we added this and that? What if we added this and that and this? Oh, my goodness, that would be amazing, right? And what happens? So now we create this thing so that the thing that took us five hours the last time we did it, it only takes us one hour when we do it this time, and we're like, that was amazing. When I think about the fact that when people, like, used to go from the East Coast to the West Coast in a wagon train, and it would only take them three to six months, to me that's like, why do you want to get over there so bad? You don't even know it's over there. But human beings have this thing called curiosity. This thing called, this thing called curiosity makes us ask questions and want to know the answers to things that don't necessarily have to be answered, but I feel like I have to find an answer. How many of y'all track it? And so, so, so curiosity creates creation, but then creation leaves us feeling fulfilled and unfulfilled at the same time. So we look for connection. We find that connection. Here's what's really fascinating about connection. Connection creates conflict. By the way, the fact that connection creates conflict is one of the most important reasons we need to connect. Because it helps us develop self-discipline and empathy when we're connected to people that disagree with us. See, because connection creates conflict, I need to learn how to speak the truth in love. As my daughter says, uh, truth, uh, truth should never travel without love. I mean, truth should never travel faster than love. Like when we're connecting with people that we want to be connected with, here's why we're connected with them because love travels at the same speed or faster than truth. But here's what I say as an addendum to that. Love should never travel without the truth. See, there's, there's no such thing as a one side. The evening and the morning were the first day. God, there, God separated the light from the darkness. Light and darkness is distinction. Light and darkness is polarity. Polarity has to exist in order for a thing to be real. What do I mean polarity? A negative and a positive? I'm gonna, I'm gonna, y'all want me to help y'all? Y'all want me to help y'all solve like human conflicts with people that you care about, but sometimes you don't feel like they care about you, and sometimes you don't really want to care about them. Can I get a witness? Where are my people? Where are my people? Right? Okay. Here's how you solve human conflicts. You just realize that this is not a one-sided thing, and as right as I feel like I am, they feel like they're just as right. And because I already know why I feel I'm right. When I have conflict with somebody, the thing I don't need to investigate is my reasons, because I already got that down. Can I get a witness? But I need to investigate their reasons. But the reason oftentimes we don't investigate the reasons of the parties that we disagree with is because many times we're afraid to find out that we're the ones who aren't right. 
But I'm going to tell you something. If you find out that you are the one that's not right and you change, your life doesn't get worse. It gets better. Why are we so addicted to being right? Well, because we went to a miseducational, misdirectional system that programmed us to believe that when we knew the right answer, which is nothing more than the answer that somebody else told us to memorize, it's not necessarily right anyway, so let's don't even go to that part. When we memorize somebody else's right answers, that means we're smart. So if I disagree with somebody and they disagree with me, and I disagree with somebody and they disagree with me, if I yield to their belief that means they're smarter than me, which means I'm dumber than them, and now I've lost my identity in this conflict. But I don't have to do that. Because all I have to do is look at them and say, you know what, they believe this pretty strongly. Huh. Wonder why. Because like, what they believe don't make, me, don't make a bit of sense to me. I should probably investigate it. They might be onto something that I missed. I did a video one time, on, I did an Instagram Live one time, I said, uh, called, Anytime anybody ever disagrees with me, I am right 100% of the time. It was great. Okay. So, <laughs> okay. And, and so people are like, wait, what? Any, oh, yeah. Anytime anybody disagrees with me about anything, I'm right 100% of the time. Here's what I'm right about. I'm right about the fact there's a 50% chance they could be right, and there's a 50% chance I could be right. And if I'm right, I'm going to stand my ground. And if they're right, I want to know so I can change. And here's the problem with the world we live in today. We live in a world where people hold things to be true that they are afraid to find out is a lie. Mm, I wish I had some help in here. Oh, Lord. So connection creates conflict. But the character that you develop that is like Christ is the character to have a conversation, a civil conversation with somebody you disagree with and openly and honestly examine their argument. It'll change your life. And then if you, if you still believe they're wrong, then here's what you can do. You can agree to disagree and still be friends. And people who can't agree to disagree and be friends, there's something missing. Something, as my dad would say, something in the milk ain't clean. And so what we have to do is we have to understand that you're not, you're not going to feel fulfilled without connection. And if you have connection, that connection is going to create conflict. Connections stir up conflicts. My brother Mark's back there, right there. There's my brother Mark right there, my baby brother. We don't always agree, but we always love each other. My wife and I have been married for 37 and a half years, 38 years, something like that. We don't always agree, but we always love each other. My daughter is a grown woman. I hope she's watching right now. My daughter is a grown woman. She couldn't wait to let me know that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to be in so much trouble if she sees this. <laughs> we don't always agree, but we always love each other. My son is a grown man. We don't always agree, but we always love each other. I, I, I promise you, if we would fall more in love with truth than we are with being right, it would eliminate and eradicate a lot of our conflicts. And then contribution. Contribution is such a beautiful thing. It's when you do something for somebody that they either could have done for themselves or couldn't have done for themselves, but you feel better because you contributed to the embitterment of another human being. That's why we give charity, which, by the way, I never refer to as giving back. I hate that phrase. I'm just giving back. I'm not giving anything back. I didn't get anything from it in the first place. <laughs> I support charities that I've never received a thing from. I'm not giving back to them. I'm just giving to them. Because I don't want to, as an entrepreneur and a creative, I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't feel the need at all to justify the money I make by calling it giving back so people who are unwilling to be a part of the fantastic few don't hate me. Well, if you're going to hate me, just hate on a brother. I, can, I got broad shoulders. I can handle it, baby. I don't want you to hate me, but I can handle it. I don't go along to get along. I ain't running for office. That's why I don't do political correctness. I don't do politics at all. I ain't, I don't, I, I ain't interested. It's all smoke and mirrors anyway, but don't even get me started on that old conversation. I don't do it. I'm not going to say, like, if you, want, if you ask me a question, you better want my answer. 
because I ain't fixing to give you somebody else's. Right? And so, so when I contribute to something, when I contribute to someone, I'm not, do, I'm not giving something back to them. I'm just giving something to them. It's charity. It's a contribution. And I'm doing it because I want to make another human being's life better. I'm not giving them anything back. And I'm not going to justify the money I make so people who are unwilling to go make that amount of money can feel better about me. Feel how you feel, baby. It's, it's really fascinating. I said this in my mastermind the other day. Isn't it interesting how people who are unwilling to go and create wealth know what the people who have created wealth should go do with it? <laughs> you know all the people we should give it to. Every time somebody comes to me, every time, every time somebody comes to me and says, hey, Myron, will you donate to my nonprofit? Well, what's your nonprofit? Oh, okay, cool. How much have you contributed? <laughs> this is my first question. Oh, well, none. I don't have any money yet. Okay, you don't have any money yet. Why are you starting a nonprofit instead of a for-profit? You want, you, want to, you want to build a nonprofit? I'm going to tell you the best way to build a nonprofit that you can raise unlimited amounts of money for. Y'all ready? Here it is. Go create wealth, become the first major contributor to your nonprofit, and then have a party or a dinner, invite all your rich friends, and then raise money for your nonprofit and tell them how much you gave. Oh, that old dog will hunt. <laughs> See, we have, we have, we allow, we live in a society where we've forgotten, like, that truth is actually something that exists because everybody's walking around talking about your truth, my truth, his truth, her truth. There's no such thing as his truth and her truth and my truth and your truth. There's just the truth, and anything that ain't the truth is a lie. Let's just call it what it is. Well, Myron, Myron, there's no such thing as an absolute. Are you absolutely sure about that? <laughs> if, look, here's what happened. Here's what happened. God created little mini creators. And what happens is when we have this curiosity, we start creating stuff, and then we start connecting with other people. When we take our creation and we start connecting with other people who are creating things, now we can have this thing called collaboration. And when you have, co when you have collaboration with other people who are creating, here's what you have now. Now you have a compounding effect where now the ability to create gets larger and larger and larger and larger exponentially. And if, if, if all of the people in the environment who are creating through this creation and connection and collaboration, when we all work together and we all have the embitterment of other people in mind and the, like the, everybody else we come across, if we have their embitterment in mind, what happens is now the world becomes better over time instead of worse over time. All social ills would go away if we would actually practice Matthew 6.33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. The only problem is we all have that in our vocabulary, and almost none of us have it in our dictionary. What does that mean? We all say it. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Okay, but we don't know what it means. What is the kingdom of God? Oh, the kingdom of God's heaven. Really? So I'm seeking heaven. How does that work? Where do I look? A kingdom is a compound word. It means king's dominion. So I'm seeking the king's dominion. Well, I can't seek the king to, do, to, to dominate Max's life. I can't seek for the kingdom to dominate my life or Rod's, I mean Rod's life, but I can seek for the kingdom. I can seek for God to be the king of my life. So when I'm seeking the kingdom of God, what it, actually means is I'm yielding my life to God as the sovereign king of my life. He's the sovereign king of my brain. He's the sovereign king of my eyes and my ears and my hands and my mouth and my feet and my thoughts and my feelings. He's the sovereign king of my relationships and my money, and he's the sovereign king of my business, and he's the sovereign king of everything I have. He's in charge of it, all of it, and I am completely yielded to him. The kingdom of God has come. And then when I do that, when I yield to him as the sovereign king of my life, he makes me the king over an assignment. He doesn't make me the king over other people. I don't have any royal subjects. I have a royal assignment. And he makes me the king over an assignment, and then I create in my little domain what I create, and then I use what I create to serve the human beings I come across. What if every human on earth actually did that? 
game over. Like, in less than a week, social ills go away. Every human being is seeking to, yielding to God, ruling over their assignment instead of trying to rule over people, and then using their assignment to serve every human being they come in contact with. What is that? Creation, connection, contribution. See how it all fits? It's like a well-oiled machine. This is God's design. This is God's desire. This is your best chance. That's why it says, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Oh, okay. And all these things. What things? The things he was talking about. What you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, what you're going to put on. All these things will be added unto you. Why? Because if you're creating and you're connecting and you're contributing and your focus is other people and not yourself, people are going to compensate you for the value you bring into the marketplace. It's just how life works. So what we have to do is we have to learn how to tap in to who God made us to be and the reason he made us in the first place. we got to tap in instead of just going along to get along and just doing what everybody else is doing because everybody else is doing it. Popularity does not create purity. The sky is no less blue because the blind man cannot see it. So let's just go ahead and decide. Like, 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 I can yield day by day, moment by moment. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. The scripture, by the way, tells us what the kingdom of God is. It tells us what the kingdom of God is not, and it tells us what the kingdom of God is over in Romans uh, chapter 14. It says, the kingdom of God is not meat and drink. Why does it say the kingdom of God is not meat and drink? Because there's nothing more essential to physicality than meat and drink. There's nothing physical more essential to physicality than meat and drink. Are y'all tracking? So he's saying the kingdom of God is not physical. So stop looking for something physical. The kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but it's what? It's righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Now, what does that even mean? Okay, the kingdom of God. We're talking about kingdom. So we're talking about God ruling over something. So the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. So righteousness is when I am yielded to God and he rules over my example. I exemplify righteousness, God, because not because you're watching, not because my wife is watching, not because my kids are watching, but because God's watching. I yield my life to God as sovereign king of my life because he rules over my example. Peace, what's peace? That's when God rules over my experience. That's when, that's when I can stand in a sea of humanity who's bowing down to falsehood and declare, I am not bowing down regardless of what you do. That's when I can run towards the giant that everybody else is running from because I have peace, because I'm more aware of the God that's bigger than the giant than I am the giant that's bigger than me. And I can stand when everybody bows and I can run towards when everybody else is running away. Why? Because God rules over my experience and I have peace. And then it says, joy in the Holy Ghost, what's that? That's God ruling over my expression. And my expression is an expression of joyfulness. We were talking this morning and I said, the difference between happiness and joyfulness is this. Happiness is based on happenings, which means it comes from the outside in. Joyfulness comes from awareness of his presence, which means it comes from the inside out. What I mean, it comes from awareness of his presence, because the scripture says, in his presence is fullness of joy. Do you understand? There is a mandate in Philippians chapter 4, verse 4. It says, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Well, what does the prefix re mean? If you re something, what does it mean? To do it again. So when it says rejoice in the Lord, it means again have joy in the Lord. When? Always. And then what? Again, I say what? Rejoice. Or again, I say again, rejoice. Again, have joy in the Lord always, and again, I say again, have joy. That sounds pretty perpetual. Sounds pretty continuous. I didn't see an intermission or a commercial. Well, how do I do that, though? I don't know how to be perpetually joyful. What about the stuff that's going on in my life? That's the problem. What about the fact that my car broke down? What about the fact that I lost my job? What about the fact that the doctor gave me bad news? What about the fact that my child is wayward? What about the fact that my spouse is wayward? What about this fact? That's all reality. Here's what I found out. We can have peace in the presence of pain, and we can have joy in the presence of junk. How? Because the scripture, it tells us in the next verse, all we got to do is keep reading. If we just read down to verse 5, we'd have the solution. Here's what it says. Let your moderation be known unto all men. Self-control. What kind of self-control? The self-control to be perpetually joyful. 
Let your moderation be known unto all men. Why? The Lord is at hand. What does that mean? That means he's present. So the problem, your real joyful problem, your real problem why you have a problem with joyfulness is not because of what's going on in your life, but it's because you're more aware of what's going on or what's not going on in your life than you are the presence of the Lord. Because if you're aware of his presence, you know he's the Lord of the thing that's going on in your life or the thing that's not going on in your life. Anyway, so you got, like, when, you, when we as followers of Christ, we have, we have trusted the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ for the propitiation of our sin, and we are not walking in a state of perpetual joyfulness, all we are doing is letting our lack of moderation be known unto all men and showing the world that we are unaware, fully unaware of the presence of Christ. So, Creation is stirred up by our curiosity. Connection stirs up conflict. And contribution stirs up a contrast. And here's the contrast. The people who can serve the people who can't. The people who love, love the people who hate. The people who have, give to the people who don't have. And if we can live our lives being productive enough to create, connect, and contribute, we can change the world. Isn't God word, God's word awesome? This is in the, stuff is in the book of Genesis, y'all. The first book in the Bible, if you don't make it to Exodus now, you're going to be okay, baby. I appreciate y'all so much. I appreciate y'all on YouTube. I appreciate y'all on Zoom. appreciate the folks in the room. I have, ran I have ranted for long enough. And I got another class I got to teach in 12 minutes. So like the video, comment, subscribe, share, notification bell, any other YouTube thing that you can think of that I forgot to say, do that too. And by the grace of God, we will look forward to seeing you next Wednesday. All right, bye for now. Isn't God's word awesome? God's word is awesome.